Hello everyone and welcome to this uh, webinar on uh, Internet of Skills where we have uh, speci specifically invited the advisory board of the Nordic IoT Center and also a few extra uh, participants that will be uh, joining. Today we're going to talk about Internet of Skills and just for your information we have uh, started to record this uh, webinar and we will of course pause that when we do the group sessions uh, workshops uh, and then resume uh, afterwards so um, let's uh, get started here one minute past um, so yeah Today, uh, the Nordic IT Center has about 55 partners, all from the industry and academia, and combined, uh, you represent about 150 different uh, IoT uh, use cases, uh, which gives us a, a combined expert knowledge in technical implementation, also business applications. So we already have a lot of knowledge about IoT and how we use that. However, um today the internet of skills is emerging and we will talk a lot more about what the internet of skills is but basically uh it gives us an opportunity to understand uh internet of skills in a new light uh, it also helps us into gaining momentum for uh, internet of skills by using some of these existing iot use cases into uh, new uh, specific uh, IO internet of skills services uh, and then we want to uh, also create new uh, Internet of Skills solutions by transformation uh, one or two of the IoT solutions into an Internet of Skills solution. So uh, Christian will come back to this uh, later on, but we want to launch a, a demonstration project basically uh, following the findings that we've had in this uh, workshop to figure out how can we create an Internet of Skills solution based on IoT technology. Um, so uh, today uh, the agenda is that I will introduce the, the webinar. I'm Anna Münster from uh, Force Technology. Then we will do an introduction to Internet of Skills by Michele Colli, also a colleague here in uh, Force Technology. Then Alejandra uh, will uh, help us to do a brainstorming session uh, with uh, our partners from uh, IoT into this Internet of Skills perspective and uh, the current solutions. Then uh, Toktam Mahmoudi from King's College London will introduce us to the vision of Internet of Skills. So uh, we will just introduce the basic principles, but uh, Toktam will take us further into what, uh, what is the long game on, on Internet of Skills. And then uh, Misha Dola from uh, Ericsson, uh, San Francisco, will tell us about uh, the opportunities and new communication standards and haptics. And then lastly, we will have uh, Christian Kluck to present about the 5G Innovation Hub, proof of concepts and uh, 5G guaranteed services and how they interrelate with the Internet of Skills. So uh, please uh, have your camera on and your microphone off. It's nice to see that everybody is uh, reacting and uh, how you uh, experience this uh, webinar. Uh, it also makes the engagement more lively. So uh, to sum it up very uh, briefly, the Internet of Skills is basically the ability to transmit practical skills in near real time uh, through the Internet. So you can say that uh, where we with Internet of Things has a focus on creating a digital representation of a physical object or entity, uh, through the internet, then what we focus on with the Internet of Skills is how can we transmit the skills through the internet. And of course, that requires a lot of things to have data accessible, to also have near real time interaction with the, the subject, uh, the person or the robot that we're interacting with to transfer our skills. But basically, uh, this is a, a rather simple concept. And the reason why we also pick up on this in the Nordic IoT Center and Force Technology is basically because uh, what we saw when uh, IoT emerged 
we had a, uh, a blossoming of the opportunities before we talked about machine to machine type communication, etc. And that was all very good. But once the, the concept of Internet of Things emerged, we saw a boom of interest within this field. And just in the same way, we uh, envision that the Internet of Skills as a concept will do the same thing. So, uh, to put things a little bit into perspective, what we often see when we talk about Internet of Things is a lot of graphs with data. We see devices with electronics, and then we see all of these things. And it can be everything from kayaks to tunnels to tires to etc. You all know all of these cases. But when we talk about Internet of Skills, it's about uh, people or uh, skills being needed in a specific location. And how do we transfer those? Uh, we've just taken a picture of two of our colleagues here in Force who are doing inspections of bridges. This is a hard to access location. Uh, it requires safety training. It requires uh, a lot of uh, expertise, instrumentation, etc. And a lot of those uh, overhead costs that we have in putting the right people in the right places, also where it's sometimes highly skilled people, then we can do that more efficiently by having a less experienced engineer visit the bridge. And if he encounters an issue, a problem, something that he needs some additional skills uh, being present on site, then if we can transfer those to him, we can have less experienced people uh, available on uh, the, the site. S similarly, uh, but less industrial, uh, we see a lot of um, uh, solutions through the internet where you can be taught to play an instrument over the internet uh, before you had to have physical access to to the teacher being close by to be taught uh, how to play the piano but now we start to see that you can have remote teaching and the first instance of that is of course just that we have uh, uh, and web uh, interface uh, uh, video conference where you can be taught how to play the piano, but you can also have a haptic feedback. So when I learned to play the piano, uh, I think I was in the second grade, so about eight years old. I remember that my teacher placed her hands on top of my hands to sort of let me show me how I was supposed to play. And, and those kinds of, of haptic feedbacks directly from the teacher, we can now uh, have a glove that, that does the same thing. But it's important to see that the Internet of Skills is focused on the people and the skills being present uh, remotely rather than a thing that we are controlling. So uh, what is the framing for today? Uh, we're going to talk about the, the current application uh, cases of Internet of Skills. Uh, how, how do we see some, some examples of that? Uh, how can we describe the value that can be generated through this concept? And also, what are the challenges that needed to be considered to, to implement it, at, at least uh, first in a, a small scale solution, but also when we go full blown to, to Internet of Skills? So I've taken uh, just a few cases from uh, Nordic IoT Center uh, to, to sort of highlight that Internet of Skills is already happening, but it's being uh, coined uh, in relation to Internet of Things. So um, Data Response has a, a solution called GreenSpeed that can show uh, drastic uh, decreases in the usage of fuel in public transportation, specifically trains, uh, where it is a remote assistance to the driver. So in an, a, a true traditional IoT uh, perspective, we tend to think of this as something, the thing is the train that we are controlling or monitoring at least. But if we start to look at this as Internet of Skills and data response is already doing that, we see this as a teacher who has some skills about driving trains that can be transferred to the driver. So how do we do that uh, best possible? The next case uh, is, let me just wait for the slide. From uh, Nuxnode. Uh, Extron, uh, they are making uh, production lines, machinery and services to the plastic industry. So today we have uh, 
uh, available a large stream of data to monitor the performance, the overall equipment efficiency of those machines, and of course also do improvements. But whenever you want to do uh, more speci specific improvements, you need to be on site. And we need to talk about how do we have the automation experts and the uh, physical goods flows experts being present within this um, uh, manufacturing site uh, remotely that are distributed throughout the world. How do we have the expert skills being available uh, on site through the access of this data? So that can either be that we again have an interface to a less skilled professional uh, that we then instruct through uh, uh, augmented reality or VR or just by voice instructions on how they are going to adjust the machines based on the data which is available. So another case of skills being transferred from a professional to another. The last case, uh, and now we uh, we had the pleasure of uh, LNT Technology Services to to give us some more uh, info on uh, one of their cases. Um, they also have another uh, three other cases available on Nordic IoT Center DK. Um, but uh, here they have a, a real tail uh, solution where it's a company that uh, manufactures and sells marking, tracking, uh, computer printing technologies. Uh, and they see an opportunity in this uh, retail space. But one of the challenges is, of course, that we need to manually check that the items uh, in the store are uh, on the shelves and how often we need to restock them. We also need to do planning about where to replace all of the individual uh, items within the store uh, to optimize the, the right locations, uh, whether we have uh, invalid uh, promotions, etc. So how do we create a, a data trace? Well, this is something that LNC Technology Services already created. Uh, so they've created a data trace on what items on the shelves are being uh, picked uh, on a cloud-based uh, solution and also uh, how can we do this automatically through robotic uh, restructuring uh, stocking? Uh, so basically we take and, and transfer some of the skills needed by uh, physical people being available to a robotic solution, but also where the experts into uh, planning both promos, but also uh, location layouts of, of these stores can be optimized in the longer run. And you can see on the next slide, that um, they're already uh, showing uh, demonstrations of, of restocking and how much revenue is generated by, by each of these sections. So um, what's going to happen in this, this webinar is basically that each of you are IoT experts, or most of you are IoT experts, so I hope that you will uh, think about your uh, own uh, business, and think about an IoT solution specifically that could be suited for an Internet of Skills application. So in a minute, Michaela will present more specifically what is the Internet of Skills, and please try to have that case in the back of your head, because when we go into the group session uh, where we will work on all of your cases, you will first discuss what are then your individual cases uh, in groups of four, uh, and then once you've done that, uh, you choose in the group one of these cases to move on. And then we have some work templates where you can discuss in an Internet of Skills light, how will this solution look like? And will it give us some advantages, both with respect to the solutions that becomes available, but also with respect to the market potential that we can gain? So let's see what happens when we replace the things in Internet of Things to skills in Internet of Skills. Yes, thank you, Anas. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Michele Colli and uh, I'm an industrial IoT specialist here in, uh, in Force Technology. And um, uh, in the past months, uh, we, we started looking into, into Internet of Skills and uh, trying to understand what is this new thing, this new element and how this could be valuable for um, especially for production companies we are working with. Uh, so, um, of course, first question was, what is that? What is the Internet of Skills? And, uh, and 
what we figured out is that it's basically a new term that has been coined by King's College London uh, researchers, which we have uh, today with us. Um, and and, and the, the whole idea was to have a term that could uh, frame the new concept of transmitting practical skills uh, in near real time through the internet. Um, it's, it's, of course, partly using existing ideas, for example, what we know as assistance tools, so using AR or VR based tools to help uh, transmitting skills over the Internet or remotely. But the term here is more general and is including different types of technologies and different types of skills that can be transmitted over over the Internet within different domains. So why is this? possible today what is uh, what is this uh, enabling it today um, uh, we can say that one thing uh, uh, one of the main enablers that makes this possible today is the uh, the possibility to have 5g connectivity um, 5G connectivity is what is today ensuring or trying to ensure high speed, low latency and ultra reliable communication. And when it comes to sharing over the Internet skills and of course data, um, we need to have this in order to have it in place. So this is probably today the main driver for that. Uh, but why are we looking into that? Why is this interesting? Why do we think that? This is an interesting topic and 5G uh, should be used to enable this uh, because we have four. We discussed that and we figured out uh, talking to, to companies we work with that there are four main issues that today we can we can address with that. Uh, number one is that several of them had uh, the need of very specific skills and specialists with very specific skills uh, uh, only on a temporary basis. So we need that very specific skill three times a year. It's fundamental for us, but we need it three times a year. And here the case, there are two possible cases. Either we hire someone with that specific skills and we keep a very low utilization, but when we need the skill, then we have it. Or we try to retrieve that skill only when we need it, but it could be very, very challenging. So this is one of the issues we, we detected. Another issue is that uh, we have sometimes very specific skills that are needed in places that are very inaccessible and we can think about so for example if you need some very specific skills today in a place like ukraine it might be very challenging to transmit and transfer these skills there so uh, this is another issue that should be addressed uh, third uh, issue is that uh, the pandemic covid19 pandemic has shown us how it could be uh, from one day to the other very challenging to travel from one country to another one and we had several companies that had to service their machinery in other countries and it could be extremely challenging to to travel and uh, instead of having one day traveling it was one day traveling plus uh, the need for staying in isolation for three days plus the need for solving a problem plus the need for traveling another day and staying in isolation another four days so the costs were exploding and finally the sustainability focus uh, there is a lot of uh, traveling uh, when we think about service activities in production industry and all this traveling is of course having an impact both on the quality of people life on uh, uh, the profit margin of a company and uh, on uh, the co2 footprint of service activities so this became to be the the four main reasons why we thought this was very interesting for the companies we work with um so if we if we think about internet of skills how does it look like what is the the anatomy of that uh, we can divide it in three main blocks. Uh, we have on one hand uh, the controller, on the other hand the controlled, and in the middle we have a network. What are them? How do they work? Well, of course, on one side with the controller we have uh, the human or the machine which is holding the skills that we need. And we have the technology that is capable to translate the skill into some skills data which can be transmitted. Uh, on the other hand, we have the controlled uh, box where we have uh, who needs the skill, so the skill user, which again could be a human or could be a machine, 
uh, we have a code that is translating the skill, skills data um, and we have a technology that can be used to apply that skill remotely. And in the middle, we have the network. So we have this bi-directional communication, which is on one hand uh, capable to transfer the skills, the, the data from the control box to the from the controller box to the control box. And on the other hand, is able to transmit feedback data from the skills user from the controlled to the controller. So we can we can uh, uh, in a in a simple way we can frame uh, the anatomy of the Internet of Skills in this way. Um, what are the main application fields today? Uh, as we said, this is a new uh, umbrella. This is a new term that makes possible for us to uh, map this new concept, but we already have some applications examples and uh, and we address three main fields. Uh, the first one is the medical field and uh, a very good example of that is uh, a remote surgery. Um, the possibility of having uh, a surgeon located uh, in one country having very specific skills for that specific surgery um, and the capability to control uh, a robot, uh, a surgical robot located in another location uh, where the patient is located and have the surgeon remotely controlling the robot. Uh, we have another field which is the education field and Anas already mentioned how um, uh, Internet of Skills can be used for uh, supporting uh, uh, education and training when it comes to piano lessons. But of course, we know about using, for instance, VR for uh, remote training of multiple teams across the world um, in real time or in near real time when it comes for, uh, for example, servicing uh, um, wind uh, turbines. And the third uh, field, which is what is uh, interesting us the most is the industrial field. Um, we see a lot of uh, a lot of demand here, a lot of potential at least. So uh, we basically started talking to uh, partners and companies in the industrial domain we're working with, uh, trying to explain to them what is this new Internet of Skills concept and if they see uh, any potential for them or if they can uh, already provide us with some examples of how they are applying some technologies to sustain this concept. Uh, what we found out is that, uh, as we expected, the main uh, or one of the main uh, areas that interest our uh, our customers or our partners is the maintenance and support area. We have the example of uh, this uh, fish. Uh, um, this company producing machines for uh, for cutting and cleaning fish. It's located uh, in uh, in Denmark and it's selling these machines across the world. And since they are mostly processing salmon, uh, as you can imagine, these machines are sold in Iceland, Greenland and very remote places in Norway. And uh, the challenge is that when there is a problem with these machines, uh, the service team from this from this company has to fly their technicians uh, and be able to reach these remote locations and solve the issue and restart the machine within six hours. Why is that? Because salmon and food in general is a perishable good. So you really need to be quick. Otherwise, you have to start throwing away your raw material. Um, when they heard about this uh, type of technology, of course, they said, well, it could be very interesting for us to be able to support remotely local uh, technicians uh, in these remote areas so they can solve the issues by themselves. Um, another example, another uh, another field uh, is uh, is the training field. And again, we uh, we already uh, quickly discussed it, but uh, there is a company we talked to called Stenhoy, uh, which is um, providing lifts that they sell uh, um, all over the world uh, in different uh, automotive workshops. And, uh, and they said that they started using virtual reality to train all the employees in different workshops when they need to change the layout, especially for big workshops. And they do this to enhance safety in these workshops. So when they have to change the layout, operators will already be used to this new, this new layout. Um, another area is the inspections and calibration. And as 
Anas uh, mentioned, this is um, a big part of the of our business in force technology. We have business units dealing with inspecting bridges and wind turbines and uh, or oil rigs, uh, offshore oil rigs. And as you can imagine, this can be a fairly expensive task, not necessarily because it's uh, a complex task to perform, but uh, mostly because these uh, bridges or wind turbines or offshore uh, uh, oil rigs are located in, again, remote locations or locations that are difficult to reach or are very time consuming to reach. Uh, so once again, having the chance to remotely connect and support the local technicians to perform these inspections could be very, very time saving. Um, other area, uh, control. We made the example with a, a robotic surgery uh, where we have a surgeon which is remotely controlling a robot, uh, but of course it could be also remotely controlling a ship which is stuck in the Suez Canal. And uh, finally, we have uh, we have the supervision area, and we had a we had a talk with um, with Vestas, which is the biggest wind turbine manufacturer in the world, and um, and uh, it it was very interesting because when we presented this, they actually told us, oh, this is very relevant because now blades and wind turbines in general they are becoming bigger and bigger, and we need to disassemble them more and more in order to transport them. So when they get to the location where they have to be installed we need local technicians to reassemble them and install them. And of course, they are not specialized in wind turbines. It's local technicians that are hired for the job. And the challenge is to ensure on one hand, the quality of the assembled good, and on the other hand, to ensure the efficiency of the assembly process. So they developed uh, this tool that they, they just deployed, uh, which is based on augmented reality, to have a specialized technician located in Denmark or wherever, which is supervising the most critical assembly operations to make sure that the, the local uh, technicians have guidance to perform things in the right way, with a good quality and with the right efficiency level. So what are the benefits and what are the challenges? Um, on one hand, if we uh, look at this from the skills holder perspective, well, of course, we will have the reduction of several non value adding activities. It could be traveling, for instance, uh, and, and this will increase their uh, utilization of specialized workforce. We have a lot of specialists and instead, instead of having them traveling for 90% of the time and uh, perform their core uh, uh, activities for 10% of the time, we will have them performing 100% of the time because they don't have to travel in remote places. They can they can support local mechanics or local uh, uh, operators remotely. Uh, this would increase the output and of course in this way reduce the skills cost and increase their skills market growth. Uh, if we sit on the other side, so if we sit on the from the if we look at this from the skills user perspective, then this reduction of skills cost would also reduce the cost barrier that they have when they have to access these skills. This would, of course, increase the use of uh, specialized skills remotely and therefore increase, reduce the quality issues and reduce the downtime and improve efficiency and output as well. Of course, we have some challenges coming with that. So uh, this is this is a, a, a good story and this is um, our reflections and our discussions with the companies, but of course the maturity of this field is still uh, at its early stages. So what are the challenges? We identified three main challenges and on one hand we have the uh, skills uh, legitimacy and uh, I was reading one of the papers I reviewed that uh, as the internet um, made uh, uh, as the internet democratized knowledge the internet of skills will democratize practical skills and uh, indeed this is this is true uh, but we also have to consider that the democratization of knowledge that we had with the internet also generated some issues uh, we had the phenomenon of fake news or not legitimate knowledge and most likely we will need a mechanism to control this also for practical skills so we will need to make sure that who is providing us the skills actually has these skills, is certified for these skills. 
Um, second point is cybersecurity. Uh, when I have a signal coming to me from another country or, uh, or continent helping me doing something, I have to make sure that we have no interferences in this signal. If I am receiving an operation from a surgeon in another country, I want to make sure that the signal that comes to me is exactly the signal he is sending. And then uh, third, we have the, the technology uh, challenge, of course, because there is still the need for uh, uh, making sure that we can comply with latency requirements, with interoperability, etc. So there is still a lot of work to be done within the technology domain. So where do we go from here? Uh, well, we need to make sure that we can, uh, first of all, help companies identifying how they can take advantage of these technologies to provide their customers with a better offer or to get a better offer from their suppliers. So how can we identify iOS value propositions? Now we will have uh, Alejandra helping us um, in a structured workshop trying to, to, to help us identifying this new value proposition going from Internet of Things value proposition to Internet of Skills value propositions. Yes, perfect. Thank you, Michele. Um, I'm Alejandra, as Michele mentioned, I am service designer here at FORCE and we thought of doing this exercise because we have all of you in this room and the information is quite valuable, but it's good to, in the middle of uh, getting all this knowledge, to see if we can put it in more practical terms so that you end up the day with something like, okay, now I can see that I could take this first step or, you know, which cases could be relevant for us. And um, as Anna's mentioned at the beginning, I'm sure you all have use cases in your mind and you think oh, this could be relevant for, for our company. Um, we have done some breakout rooms. I will explain how it will work. We've, we've already done those rooms, so you will all go to a different room um, and we'll do a bit of an online workshop um, where we will try to answer these three main questions. First is we, we want you to identify a challenge, so you will be mixed in the teams. As you, the first minutes you will try to discuss or you know talk about what what use cases you find relevant in your company, and then agree on which one, even if it's not your own one that you think okay this is actually a good opportunity or a use case we can use for these twenty minutes half an hour we have for the workshop. Um, then you will go into more or less defining the iOS anatomy. It doesn't have to be very specific because we have only so much knowledge, but you know, who are the, which skills do you think you could transfer with that solution and who would be on the other side, who would be in the controlled side, who would receive those skills. Um, and then define more the, the value. Uh, what do you think the Internet of Skills uh, can get the company back? Um, I'll go more in detail. Uh, the specific is we'll split into break, uh, breakout rooms. You'll discuss this, the cases, potential solutions, and pick one of them. You'll brainstorm on the other two questions, and then at the end, we'll pick randomly a team to present. Uh, and it's very high level. There's no judging here, no, no wrong answers. Um, being more specific in the first question, uh, yeah, it might be that, you know, identifying a challenge, maybe challenges are related to distance, as we saw from Anna and Michele, you know, remote locations or very far away or accessibility. Maybe it's the, the solution or the, the need is in a country where you can't go uh, due to a war, due to a pandemic, due to a natural disaster, whatever the reason that is, or due to time, you know, support is needed fast and timely and you can't make it on time. We chose these three, but if you find another para parameter, then feel free to, to use it as well. But this will help you frame more or less what challenge or opportunity could you have uh, from the use case. Then the second question is the iOS anatomy. Uh, you will, we want you to look at, okay, the controller side, which skills hold, uh, skills should we transmit and who would be the skills holder? Is it a computer? Is it a person? Um, and the part of the network, we will assume that everything works fine. We have the low latency and ultra reliable connectivity, so we don't have to think about that. And then we have, or you will have to brainstorm and discuss who would be the controlled uh, part of the ecosystem, who is the skills user, and if you can go to what technology could we use, but you don't have to go that deep. And then the last question is, what is the value? that you would think uh, you would get back. And we frame it into people, planet and profit. Uh, people, like the example here, less exposure to dangerous environments, you know, maybe chemicals or again, natural disasters or whatever. A uh, planet is obviously by, by reducing traveling, you have less CO2 emissions or anything related to that. And then profit, obviously you have uh, less expenses and more competitiveness. 
Um, when I will, I'm actually right now sharing a link in the chat of this conversation. I hope you can get it. Otherwise, I'll get it now before you go into breakout rooms and you will get access to a Google document, all of you. Um, in that Google document, the third three slides are will be uh, the slides that I just show you explaining what is it that we want you to solve and then each team will have a slide that looks like this with the color code and the team number so you the idea is that you fill in this you know you identify a challenge whether it's from related to distance to time accessibility or to the three of them uh, you pick one and you write it down um, again the anatomy who is the skill holder what type of skills and then the value frame so you will all uh, have a, a document that can freely come in and, and fill in so let me do this. Let's just uh, do that. And, and in uh, the meantime, I can say that each of you, you will be uh, distributed into rooms. We'll have access to a Google Doc. I can't hear you, Anas, but yeah. So you everybody can see it in the chat, access. I hope. So please uh, click on it and go. And I'm, I'm guessing it will only be one person from the team writing on the on the document. Uh, but yeah, feel free to just discuss it between yourselves. And then we're going to split into breakout rooms now. And then we'll drag you back in 20 minutes, 25.